again to our conference research and knowledge production in our practice which is uh, session two of our uh, larger conference uh, uh, knowledge uh, research and knowledge production in arts practice and uh, we had some wonderful keynote so far this is going to be our third keynote by dr jonathan harris and i hand over the moderations to dr ranu roy choudhury who has been kind enough to moderate these sessions thank you so much over to you ranu um thank you atul um for inviting me to moderate this session and thank you all for joining i welcome you again to the second session of the day when we discuss the ecosystem of the contemporary art research a um, few words on why we thought of ecosystem our understanding of ecosystem broadly draws on susan sontag's invocation of ecology of images that she conceptualized way back in 1979 and something that has been frequently referred since I quote Sontag, quote, uh, if there can be a better way for the real world to include the one of images, it will require an ecology, not only for real things, but of images as well, close quotes. In other words, the idea of an ecology of images or an ecosystem around images compels us to seriously considered Im consider images as a constitutive part of reality. Uh, Santag, of course, was uh, talking about the photographic image, and uh, most discussions on image ecology thereafter have been on visual images and visual media. Uh, among others who worked with this kind of a systems approach are W. G. T. Mitchell and Mark Hansen, and in their 2010 publication, Critical Terms for Media Studies, they argued how, and I quote them, media are themselves mediated. Close quotes. um in other words how media including visual arts practices operate within an interconnected system in 2013 sunil nankani responded to santosh's provocation to argue for simultaneous considerations of and i quote mankani history's connections cultures and adaptations close quotes interestingly the scholarly tradition i just briefly uh, touched upon are located explicitly or implicitly within the purview of academic research and since yesterday we have had rich discussions on the tensions between academic and artistic researchers needless to say especially to this group of people that jitish kalad used uh, ecosystem as an operative category for his curatorial practices in the kochi biennale I guess by uh, thinking contemporary art research in terms of ecosystem, we are exploring three layers of understanding. First, how arts research uh, function within interconnected networks of people, ideas, practices, and institutions, as well as spaces that Jibesh Bakshi phrased earlier this morning as post-institutional arena. Second, how might we think about both academic and art research as continuously evolving, reimagining terrains as being self-reflexive and as co-constituting one another? And finally, how would um, how words like ecology and ecosystem and the ideas and histories they connote have become integral parts of artistic inquiry and more generally humanistic inquiry? and how there has been a transition from biological metaphors and visual arts to art system terminologies on that note we have professor jonathan harris with us to deliver the keynote lecture for this session and his talk is titled the institution of artistic research in the british higher education context politics philosophy and uh, economics jonathan harris is a professor at the birmingham school of art the united kingdom He has a PhD in American art and politics of uh, the 1930s and has taught at several British universities including Keele, Liverpool, Southampton and now Birmingham City University. Specializing in modernist and contemporary art, Harris has published 20 books and over 100 book and journal essays. Harris's most recent studies are the Global Contemporary Art Worlds uh, published in 2017 by Blackwell terrorism and the arts practices and critiques in contemporary culture production from routledge in 2021 and a 2023 forthcoming book titled contemporary art and the conflicts of globalization 
In his talk today, Professor Harris will reflect on the implications of specific forms of institutionalization of art research in the British Isles, and I quote him, its impact on UK higher ed arts education and on the visual arts more broadly, and consider both the losses and gains politically, philosophically, and economically of institu institutionalization, close quotes. Without further ado, Professor Harris, over to you. Thank you very much, Rano. It's a great privilege to be taking part in this event. Um, I hope you can hear me properly. You can, yep. <laughs> Good. And thank you very much for inviting me. Um, there's a personal and subjective aspect to this topic that I can't easily eradicate. And perhaps it's right that I include it, given that my own career in UK universities has always included dealing with the institutional evaluation of my own art history and art theory books and essays, or what they call research outputs. So get ready for a lot of jargon terms here. The temptation to remove the personal dimension is partly a reflex, given the governing ideology and set of assumptions that authentic, useful research is, or certainly should be, an objective, non-partisan analytic enterprise. This probably seems or seemed even more surprising an idea when considering artworks or artistic practices as research. Given modernism's fetishism of subjective expression, feeling and sensations. Late modernism, postmodernism and contemporary art as we know, however, have all turned towards ideas and ambitions of documentary, social and socio-psychological realities, political and ideological critique. So the possibility of this kind of artistic research being in some credible sense objective or testable or verifiable isn't perhaps so far-fetched. You may have gathered then how complex and interesting this idea of the institution of artistic research is. It is partly because the meaning and purpose and evaluation of any kind of research is because it raises philosophical, political and economic issues that dominate our world, its present crises, conflicts and uncertain possible futures. The idea that art, whatever we mean by that, has some role more or less important in these possible futures is what's kept me going as a writer and an academic over 35 years and the hope that my contribution to this via my own research has some sort of significance too. I want to start with a bit of background and build up to look at what a phrase like artistic research might mean. Now I emphasised in my abstract that the British University context has produced a particular kind of institutionalisation of research of art research and of related practices and procedures organized in and across its universities and their central government administration and management, such as doctoral, PhD, artistic research degrees, ideas of practice led or practice based research methods in the arts and research council funded artistic research projects. The latter have become much more common over the last 10 to 15 years. And I do spend quite a lot of time working as a reviewer for the government evaluating proposals from many UK university based artists and their academic and museum colleagues in other institutions. That's because another central feature of funded research in UK universities, especially in the arts and humanities, is the belief that academics should work with non-university organisations of many kinds, cultural, public and commercial, in order to maximise the public benefit uh, or impact, another jargon term, impact of their research activities and outputs. There is also a now long established orthodoxy that multi or interdisciplinary research is better than single subject research, producing better outcomes or findings, better in the sense of being more innovative, original, significant, 
and possibly more rigorous too. These are all buzzwords that we can return to if you want to. So these are the jargon words that really dominate the British system. On this final point, I remain agnostic. I have seen some very good interdisciplinary research projects, including by artists, and some very bad ones, and some very good single subject projects and some poor ones too. Whether you define artistic research as a single subject per se, or as part of a multi or interdisciplinary practice is another question and convention of understanding that we can reflect on. Before about 1986, none of this had much of a role in British university life. There was no agreed or imposed institutional definition of research across the faculties and certainly not in the humanities. The idea would have been and was rejected, ridiculed and opposed by a range of academic groups and individuals on both political and cultural lefts and rights. What we now confidently call research was then an integrated or dissolved quasi-private, quasi-public component of the work of academics in a small elite system of universities, teaching a small number of students, a group of independent subjects or disciplines. Research was not intellectually or institutionally separated out in any clear cut way from, for instance, something called scholarship, and even teaching. Academics did all or some of these things in particular colleges or universities with only local management of their work. It was the massive growth in the UK system from the late 1980s onwards with new and many renamed institutions and the aspiration of Tony Blair's new Labour government in the late 90s to have 50% of all 18 year old school leavers go to university that catalyzed a whole range of centralized audit processes tied to new funding and development programs. And these were both sticks and carrots of various kinds. This expansion reached its height around 2005, 2006 in terms of funding and organizational growth in the UK HEI sector, that's higher education institution, the HEI sector, just before the financial crash in 2007, 2008. The universities had on the one hand by then been made legally autonomous, but on the other, their core funding was handed over to parents as consumers in the form of student loans for their children to spend and the cost was raised to £9,000 per year, more or less across the board, as the cash value of a single undergraduate academic session one year. In practice now, the universities are more audit bound and micromanaged than ever before. Though some, Oxford and Cambridge, of course, have private funds, massive private wealth, that make them more capable of independent action than most of the other about 250 institutions that are called universities in the UK. So when I speak of the institution of artistic research, I mean both the noun and the process. Artistic research understood as a verifiable, countable thing exists within as the creature of a regulatory discourse of the UK university system. It was the late comer to this party, the last overcoming resistance from traditional humanities academics and some university based artists too, only in the later 1990s and gaining representation through a government research council on equal terms with the sciences and social sciences only around 2005 through what is called the AHRC or Arts and Humanities Research Council. The Arts Council of England, which you might know, the, or ACE, Arts Council of England, and its sister agencies in Wales and Scotland does not fund any research activity directly taking place in universities. Though in practice, the AHRC and ACE work together in a variety of indirect ways across public institutions of many kinds, including in universities. The significance of the economics part of artistic research shouldn't be underestimated. 
The amount of money available from central government to reward and fund research activity has varied depending on the fortunes of the Treasury and the ideological colour of particular and mostly conservative party governments in Britain since the late 1980s. The vast bulk of this money, of course, goes to science, technology and medical research funding, far less to social sciences, the humanities and the arts. The funding available also hit its high point around 2007, at the end of the uh, six to seven year audit cycle that generates the whole process, just before the crash again in 2007, 2008. The evaluation and award mechanisms, algorithms and formulas are complex, but to simplify, research outputs, another one of these jargon terms, which includes things like books, journal essays, artworks, but they must be publicly manifested in an exhibition context to count. That's a key part of the definition of research and it's publicly available. Um, also includes exhibitions and exhibition catalogues. All of these research outputs are given what's called a star rating. One star means subnational significance. Two star is national sub significance. Three star is what's called world class. And four star is called world leading. Now, four star funding has been many times more generous financially than three star although the rates and the streams of funding are reviewed for every audit cycle. The assessment is done via what's called peer group assessment by academics who are seconded to the audit panels, moderated by senior functionaries and civil servants, and the overall funding is adjusted in secret by the government. In 2007, the money, comparatively speaking, was generous. Very successful four star departments with lots of submissions or academics grouped into what are called units of assessment, another jargon term, unit of assessment. Art and design, for instance, is a unit of assessment. They found themselves getting sometimes millions of pounds of funding over a seven year period. So the very successful departments can become quite rich. The business of artistic research in universities is important. It has generated substantial amounts of funding that must legally be spent only on future research activities. It can't be spent on anything else. And it can enable successful individuals, the stars, for instance, to effectively buy themselves out of other university activities, such as teaching or, or management activities. You can begin to see, I hope here, how the funding regime begins to skew the activities and values of departments, academics, faculty in the American sense, and in the longer term, even disciplines themselves or subjects, when certain kinds of outputs and topics and methods of research are better rewarded than others. How the institution of artistic research might change the nature of art practice or the public understanding of art and artists, or the role of galleries and museums, are interesting issues to ponder. Just a quick footnote on this idea of national and international qualities of research. This is the star business, the star rating business. These categories of evaluation were formed in the 1990s, and I think they have become almost wholly anachronistic given globalization yet they have persisted as a core feature of UK audit judgment criteria. That is to say, the government and its leading advisors, including academics, keep using them. They have real shaping and limiting effects. For instance, the submission of research outputs for audit in other than English language forms has been either impossible or highly risky up to the recent 2021 audit, which has just happened in British universities. The political economy of this in the arts and humanities is tied to academic and commercial publishing, which has always had an important indirect stake and role in the public manifestation of research, producing and marketing physical and now digital books and journals, and sometimes artworks, whose research and writing 
is usually funded by the university's salaries and grants paid to their academics as part of their work. Before I move on to consider now the institution of artistic research in a bit more detail, it's worth noting that UK central governments have also started auditing what they call teaching quality. And they periodically award bronze, silver and gold medals to universities and subject groupings, generating a range of short and longer term consequences that can also be seen as benefits and losses. What the systemic or ecological. Sorry, my sound might have gone off there. Is it? Can you still hear me? Okay, sorry. Yeah, we can hear you. That's fine. Okay, what the systemic, what the systemic or ecological relationship is between research funding and teaching funding, how one triumphs over or supports the other, and what this means for individual academics and particular departments or entire universities in some cases, is another matter for debate. Quite an important one. Now, perhaps you are very enthusiastic about the idea of artistic research, and I may have appeared sceptical or pessimistic in my comments so far. Outside of the university context, however, I can't really see why the idea of artistic research would be either necessary or useful, particularly. Some of the opposition to its institutionalization that came from artists working in universities and still does to an extent is based on the belief that art is or should be non utilitarian, free of use value, unconstrained by particular social and political interests. Artists who don't work in the university or don't want to generally don't care about it very much as an issue. However, artistic research is now a form of authentic, authorised activity, which offers the possibility for students and artists to gain access to the university, either in teaching work or in undertaking higher degrees like a PhD. There is therefore necessarily an evolving relationship between teaching and research in the visual arts as students at BA and MA or MFA levels consider or prepare to undertake doctoral artistic research. A kind of revolution in pedagogy, at least in theory or philosophical principle, has occurred in British higher art education, where learning and deploying research skills and methods have become key features of the whole curriculum, tied to encouraging what's called independent study choices and professionalization opportunities, which include further higher education study, including doing PhDs in artistic practice. In one sense, then, artistic research involves the same kinds of both exciting and mundane activities that characterize all humanities research, reading, making notes, visiting archives, looking at artifacts and forming questions or hypotheses about something. The research topic, research questions and research objectives. Programs of activity that include practical making and making of drawings, prints or photographs or installations or interactive events or whatever. The organizational initiation, support and evaluation of this process and of its outcomes, usually including artworks and some textual or written components, often now the two combined, constitutes part of this institutionalization that I've been talking about. Usually a British PhD in artistic research involves making a written proposal. In fact, I'd say that's always the case. A written proposal, including practical elements, the allocation of a supervision team, a three or four year study plan of study, and the submission of a final project of a wide, very wide variety of kinds, though in some way publicly manifest, usually in an exhibition of some kind, and then an examination event with a judgment to award or not to award the doctoral qualification. 
Resistance to the institutionalization of artistic research also came from academics from many subject areas who didn't believe that artworks, say a painting or a sculpture, could themselves constitute a research outcome because they weren't, in most cases then, textually based and intelligible as such in terms of evident findings. These key terms again coming back. Now, most artists and art historians working in universities saw the valid point in this criticism and the institutional compromise was to accept that a range of documentary components would accompany the submission of artworks, usually including some form of an essay, the thesis, um, that addressed directly in words and argument and con in concepts, the matter of defining the research topic, research tasks, research quality, research methods and findings. In fact, in this sense, artistic research was not as problematic an idea, given that it bore important similarities to the documentation of experiments in the natural sciences, where visual methods such as drawing or photographs had also often been used, or for instance, in historical and archeological research. The question of the verifiability or testability of artistic research hypotheses is more difficult to relate to epistemology in the sciences. But given that in the humanities and social sciences, at least from the 1960s, partisan interests have been recognized always to condition shape and limit ideas of objectivity and truth, it was not a great stretch of credibility to argue that artistic research in principle was at least as relatively truthful or objective. Since the 1960s too, conceptualism in all its global forms has included those artists and artist groups particularly interested in such questions and methods to do with notions of objectivity verifiability, truth and value. The group called Forensic Architecture, for instance, based at Goldsmiths College in London, is a good recent example of this. In my experience, most traditional PhD students, those writing a thesis, have always struggled to learn how to write at the length and quality required for a doctorate in a British university, which is about 60 to 70,000 words. This task, allied to undertaking archival or major reading programs, is usually a very serious challenge that belied the increasing ease with which all the UK research councils handed out grants to students, as if what was called writing up findings was a simple mechanical recording process. Well, those of us who write and write, try to write well and write at length, know that writing is actually a profoundly difficult business and a difficulty of composition and self-composition. It changes the writer as well as forms and reforms whatever the topic is that they are writing about. Writing is in no sense a mechanical or mere recording process. The institution of artistic research has made this even clearer to those, including me, who supervise practice-based PhDs. Making visual representations of all kinds and other kinds of art now, and the textual visual hybrid forms common in contemporary art in particular, emphasize this work and difficulty, difficulty of composition and the complexity of the components, aesthetic, intellectual, practical, political, situational, that inhere within it. Years ago, when artistic research was first beginning to be institutionalized in Britain, I remembered one of Jackson Pollock's well-known written statements from 1947, composed when he had applied for a Guggenheim grant. The pictures I contemplate painting, he said, quote, would constitute a halfway state between the easel and the mural, and an attempt to point out the direction of the future without arriving there completely." Unquote. 
Abstract expressionism, as we know, was the apogee of the era of art presented as an ideal, transcending the actual, though in fact its painterliness was simultaneously, we see now, a kind of concluding ecstatic materialism. According to Kurt Varnado, the then highly influential critic Clement Greenberg had virtually dictated what Pollock wrote in his application to the Guggenheim Fund. He was, in a sense, Clement Greenberg, a kind of supervisor before the letter. This anecdote offers a metaphor that might be useful in my provisional concluding definition. Artistic research is a composite intellectual and ideological construction institutionally lodged in particular social orders that serves a variety of different shifting and sometimes opposed interests and brings benefits and losses. Those felt and appreciated or bemoaned again by people placed differently in the social order, inside universities, in the commercial art world, in public museums and galleries now across the whole world. The institutionalization of artistic research guarantees nothing about the quality of either the art or the research. It doesn't help us know what good or bad art is either, though the relevance of that question seems to have steadily diminished as the paperwork regulating artistic research in universities has grown. But I'd say and finish on this, that the social purpose or function of art though not necessarily the intent or ambition of actual artists, remains the same as in Pollock's day. Quote, an attempt to point out the direction of the future without arriving there completely. Unquote. Thank you. That's it. Um, uh, thank you, Professor Harris. Um, I'm audible, right? Yep. Oh, great. Um, thank you, Professor Harris, for your talk and giving us an overview of the uh, inst institutionalization of research uh, in the UK and also giving us this kind of a provisional definition, bringing to the table the fact that neither institutionalization nor moving out of the institution guarantee quality. And I guess in some way uh, you are um, indicating that a quality, the parameter for quality research or quality artistic output arrests elsewhere than the parameters that we have been already given. Now, I have a couple of questions, I'll, and I guess I'll exercise my privilege as the chair to ask you that first. So, um, I mean, recently, like in past uh, 10, 15 years, a lot of US R1 institutions, like this privately funded with huge endowment, big re uh, rich research universities have started accepting artistic output, like humanities departments especially, have started accepting uh, artistic outputs in lieu of uh, a written dissertation. And, uh, and it is coming simultaneously when the, there are art school requiring this kind of a research PhD or research degree. Like I at least can, co you know, can talk about one philology department, like a primarily philology department that accepted uh, a film as a dissertation some years back. So I was wondering on your thoughts on this kind of two different kinds of movements happening on the one side in art schools uh, requiring this research PhD, whatever. And on the other hand, uh, the traditional humanities divisions and departments are uh, starting to accept uh, creative outputs. Yeah, I think there's a, a, a wide variety of practices and, and institutional organizations of artistic research around the world. I think we have heard about the American situation um, earlier. It's very different from the British one because we have a centralized system. Um, we have essentially no private universities. Well, there's one that I know of. Um, in America, um, I, I think many universities that are outside of you know, state systems, like the California University of California system, can basically do what they like. Um, and this is what's interesting about the elaboration of institutional research in the arts, is that we don't know how it will pan out in different places, because not all universities and uh, academic cultures are, are organized, obviously, in the, in the way that the British one is. Um, as I said in my presentation, 
it's as far as I understand it, every university in this country requires a written proposal that um, accompanies a PhD by practice um, idea. Um, in other, in the basic sense of making it intelligible to people who want to say, yes, we, we can support this. Um, I have heard of PhD submissions at the end of the process that don't include written um, elements, but I think in those cases, it usually involves artworks where there is some kind of textual intellectual component that's that's evident in it. And that's because contemporary art itself has taken into its new forms this hybrid mix of things, which includes text in, in many cases. Um, so there is a dialectic, interesting dialectic between the institutionalized Asian process and the way that contemporary art itself is changing and developing and has done over the last 20 or 30 years. Although, as I also said, you can chase the roots back to what we call conceptualism and on global conceptualism, right back, in fact, to the to the 1960s in some in some ways. Um, so uh, we can't anticipate the ways in which this will be elaborated in the future. And I hope that new models for it, perhaps in India, would take advantage of the experience and the negative sides of the uh, development that have occurred in countries like Britain. Thank you so much. I, have, I guess I have a follow-up question since you brought India in into the conversation. And uh, uh, we have been discussing since yesterday how uh, the regulatory authorities in India have started imposing specific criteria to judge artistic research, I mean, which often mimic the natural sciences, not even humanities and social sciences. And in that context, uh, I was wondering about your thoughts on the implications of grafting a US model or an UK model in or, or any model from global north onto um, India or anywhere in global south that has substantially less resources, both in terms of money and also in terms of library access, archives, and so on and so forth. And um, so what would this mean? Like quality, world class, these are buzzwords that's uh, hoovering in Indian academia as well. And I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, just quickly on that one. I think the way that this was introduced in Britain was part of a ongoing rationalization process. Um, and the, and the, the further extension of the kind of Fordism of, of higher education in this country. So it is related to the way that capitalism and neoliberalism neoliberal capitalism unfolded in the 80s and 90s in, in, in the West. Um, and it, it has, as I've tried to emphasize, it has um, gains and losses. Um, one of the divisive um, uh, elements in the British system is that um, universities now declare staff to be what they call research active or not research active. And this depends on a kind of evaluation of their personal career. So it's linked into a kind of professional review process that's going on. I imagine you are having the same thing in India. Um, how that's done, and is it if it's fair, is obviously a big part of this question. And, I, and it, as I've been a manager, ran the art school in Birmingham, I was involved in some of these decisions around who should be allocated research time as a research active member of staff. Because as you might imagine, the people who are not research active have to do other things instead with some of their time. So you get this rigid division developing between staff who have research activity time and go away from the university and those who are left to do what? More teaching. So this is why I mean there's a very difficult and sometimes um, negative relationship between having research and organizing teaching because it tends to become that the people who are research active do less and less teaching. Now we might feel <laughs> we might feel we have different um, responses to that situation depending on whether we're considering ourselves as individuals or looking after a department, for instance, um, where the whole question of the culture and quality of teaching is a key aspect of the way that the institution works and the department works. But in the British system, it has led to a kind of two-tier model where the so-called elite research universities tend to employ a lot of part-timers now to do mm -hmm. the actual teaching, which has all kinds of negative consequences, I think. Yeah, I guess a bunch of that is happening in India. And thanks for bringing in the term uh, fairness. Uh, maybe we can return to that. But meanwhile, we have 
comments uh, from audience. So the first one is from Professor Indra Prumit Rai. And he writes that thanks for a very uh, frank and uh, blunt evaluation. It just goes on to show what we are facing here in Indian universities now is a watered down version of what Britain has experienced, absolutely. And he continues that objective, non-partisan analytic enterprise is in many cases an oxymoron. What comes through is the institutional pressure to conform and privilege one form of communication over all others. Felicity Allen uh, writes uh, this question about research is critical in terms of artist work with durational projects. Uh, within a parenthesis, uh, Wittgenstein uh, wouldn't count as a research active. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, it also has problems uh, relating to women's career, absolutely, which are frequently interrupted by care work, uh, and in India more so. And yep. then Shumundo Sangupta writes, Professor Allen, uh, please ask questions or comments, that will be nice. All right, so um, Professor Harris, I was wondering if you have responses to the comments we already received in the chat box. Uh, well, I'm glad it's um, it's... It's, it sounds useful and familiar to people who work in universities. Um, and if, if you're struck in the management um, role in a university, and yet you have a foot also in research, which is what I've tried to do, you know, and maintain that as a, in fact, as a moral requirement of doing management, you have to also carry on doing research and teaching, I think, actually. Otherwise, these these are separated off and they become, they can become very divisive. And the whole organization and management can become and has in certain contexts become quite um, an aggressive bullying situation um, if managers are no longer teachers and researchers. So I think it, it's beholding people who, who take management responsibilities to carry on doing both their own research activity, if that's art, that's what they should do, and some teaching as well, um, and to hold the whole thing together. Because the experience is that if you don't, there is a, there's this invidious process of dividing up people. And it has big knock on re social reproductive effects in terms of how education is organized and the expectations of future generations of, of teachers and researchers and the value given to teaching as opposed to doing research. Um, but the broader message, I think, is that you can't separate the politics of the institution, the university, from the wider politics and struggles going on in the society. And now this is a global issue as well, uh, as I tried to point out. So I hope the you will understand the uh, internal national dimension to this and, and what's pushing it in a certain direction. And beyond that, the way that there are, there are international and global uh, aspects to this, to do with PhD students, for instance, and the kind of aggressive competition and, and attempt to find them across the world now. Uh, all, all of these issues are the sorts of things that we have to bear in mind if you, if you work in the department and try to maintain, I think, a kind of moral political basis for what you're doing. It's harder and harder. <laughs> That's all I can say. Thank you so much. Uh, so we have one more comment uh, question, I guess. Uh, comes from uh, Danny Butt, and uh, he writes, thanks, Jonathan, for an excellent and succinct analysis of the UK situation. In Australia, after largely inheriting the UK system, the same thing that we have inherited in India, we have now, and this is uh, Butt writing, we have now left publication counts or quality as a funding driver. Instead, our black research funding comes from two indicators, students, student load and external research income, which is rapidly replacing all other metrics in all financialized institutions. Can you comment on any creative solutions being found to this new mode of uh, stimulating entrepreneurialism, particularly in the context of the defunding of historical government art support. Uh, thanks for the question. I mean, it's the same concern that uh, many Indian institutions are facing. And the institution where I teach, this is some of the concerns. Yeah, please go ahead. Well, I mean, I, I don't have any, any answer to it. I mean, I think coming out of the COVID, hopefully coming out of the COVID situation, the impact on university funding is serious, drastic in some circumstances. Research will be one of the first things that's cut 
because the basic activity of universities is teaching, particularly when there's no external other kinds of funding available. This is why the system is apparently a singular one, but within it you have universities that are immensely wealthy compared with some that are very poor. Um, and so there, there isn't going to be um, one solution that's possible across the board. Some universities will not find themselves in, in terrible trouble um, in the next few years. But I know the universities that I work with ha at the moment have very serious funding gaps. And um, one of the ways this is attached, uh, one of the ways this is, is, is dealt with is by reducing the amount of time awarded for research. Because um, it also reduces the amount of part time contracts that are required, for instance, you deploy your full time staff in ordinary teaching activities and um, the core business of the university, as it were. Um, there is no magic bullet. And but I, I also just well, the other thing I wanted to say was that I didn't talk in, in any detail about particular research projects that I know about or been involved with for all sorts of reasons, so partly because some of them are confidential in terms of my, my involvement with them over the years. But I do think that, that the best ones have brought together um, artists with other kinds of researchers and um, museums and galleries um, to deal with all kinds of important issues. So the potential for the um, creative and critical use of art as a research method or as a research outcome, I think is, is very strong. In some ways, it's about the system um, supporting the best examples and, and not um, suffocating them in the way that the whole process is managed. Um, but the drive towards commercialization, I think particularly, is a one that has sometimes very negative impacts on the kinds of projects that get funding by the government. Uh, the next question comes from uh, Atul Bhalla. So Atul, please go ahead. No, uh, Jonathan, just a, a few clarifications. I think there are some institutions in the UK, correct me if I'm wrong, which kind of did away with the writing component altogether in, in, in their PhD. And then what I want to know is, did they do away with the writing, I mean, writing component within the proposals as well? And how did they manage to kind of do that? Because most of the other, they have gone all, along with the writing component as a thesis or dissertation that complements or kind of suggests, uh, you know, the writing comp uh, as research through writing. Right? Yes. So, I mean, I, yeah. I can only think of one example. Um, it, one PhD that I personally was involved with where the writing component was reduced to almost zero. Um, it, it, and the university changed the regulations from. Um, a fixed amount of words that had to be included to a, a variable one. And I think this is relatively common now, is that there's no set amount of writing that you have to do. Now, I can see good pedagogic reasons why you should have to write a certain amount, and it should be fairly extensive, because partly you're comparing the quality of the work to other degree structures and to lower degree structures like MAs or, or MPhils, for instance. Um, but this has usually happened in the cases where that I'm familiar with, where the actual practice itself has involved some textual, you know, hybrid form of, of representation or uh, or, or comp, comp, comp components of of submission that that intrinsically bring together um, evident intellectual findings with some sort of visualization technique. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, examples of, say, um, abstract artists, abstract painters, say, where, the, where there has not been some written component as part of the elaboration of the meaning of the work. That's where the um, research process is evinced, as it were. We're not arguing that the art objects themselves don't contain, um, in some sense, or manifest research findings, but it's the elaboration and the articulation of them within the process of assessment that's required. That's quite a subtle point. You can have an exhibition of an artist's work at the end of a PhD process, which is open to the public, and the people who just look at the works on display may or may not think about it in research terms. But the, the work has a different context of understanding because it's accompanied by documentary and some, some kind of written submission that elaborates and articulates the meaning of the works in research terms. And that seems to me to be a good thing and a necessary thing to maintain fairness with other kinds of PhD programs and the work of other students at that level and at lower levels as well. Thank you. 
Uh, we have a comment from uh, Felicity Allen. Uh, it goes, I was thinking, Jonathan, uh, when you were talking about the dissimilarity between US and UK within parentheses, public versus private universities, that the historically endowed universities in Britain are equivalent to the US private ones, Oxbridge particularly. So your comment about the economic range is very welcome. Thank you. I don't want to harp, harp on the point, but a lot of British universities have now big financial debts through bank loans because they've been encouraged to actually develop new campuses and overseas campuses. So the, the globalisation element of this and the globalisation of higher education and its impact on all of this is actually really quite important. And it's something that I've written about in that book you mentioned, The Global Contemporary Art World, particularly in relation to China, because the British system until very recently is structurally dependent financially on Chinese students. Now, with, with the politics that's going on at the moment, we, we're going to see, I think, a, a quite a big fall off in the number of Chinese students who come to do undergraduate and postgraduate degrees at British universities. And this may have a very destructive effect on the, the financing of British universities, not Oxford and Cambridge, but everyone else, because they've been encouraged to actually, you know, attract as many international students as possible. Of course, now India is the big market that, that's supposed to replace the Chinese market for British higher education. You can you can hear this language, you know, which is a bit like the jargon around research, you know, um, funding, affecting the way, you know, contaminating the way we think about students and what we're doing at the most basic levels. Um, and I think it's, again, something we have to watch very carefully and internationally organised against in some ways. I think what we need is a kind of global response by academics in universities to try to confront some of the pressures to marketise more and more aspects of the system. Oh, thank you so much. We are almost closing towards our time and I thank you, Professor Jonathan Harris, again and I thank you, the audience, for joining today. And now I hand it over to Atul. Thank you. Um, Atul, you need to unmute yourself. We can't hear you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Jonathan. And that was very insightful. And uh, I mean, continuing on our earlier conversations with you, I'm definitely, I mean, we are definitely going to get hold of you again for uh, sort of thrashing out some other elements because it'll you know towards you know developing a kind of a program which where we include uh, artistic research and we kind of foreground it at a different at different levels so thank you jonathan thank you ranu so much and thank you everyone